I'm Charles Wilson, Cybersecurity Engineering Technical Fellow at Motional, responsible for cybersecurity development lifecycle practice. This presentation will cover threat prioritization within the context of the AVCDL. This diagram shows the overall AVCDL training path. If you're taking this training, it's assumed that you've already completed the AVCDL overview training. This training covers threat prioritization. Unlike many aspects of product development, cybersecurity is traditionally treated like a one-man band. They're responsible for bringing their own instruments, playing their own music, and dealing with everything related to the function they try to accomplish. A classic example is that of penetration testing. You can penetration test anything. You don't need input from any other group. You just need the device and you can perform a penetration test and produce a penetration test report. This in and of itself is fine. But if we then go and look at something like threat modeling, we discovered that it's the same kind of animal. If we can have the device or the design or the requirements, we can synthesize a DFD, which we can then reason on and generate a report from. Or we could do static analysis and take all the source code and run it through a separate program, generate output, and then produce a set of results. Or perhaps we could do something like fuzz testing, where we actually have a slightly more intrusive behavior, but we still bring all of the other pieces to the table ourselves. And we again generate a report. Now, it's not desirable for us to treat all of these activities and several more in isolation, but that's the way that we've traditionally treated them. What we would like to have is not a collection of one-man bands, but rather a symphony orchestra where discrete elements can be composed and work harmoniously with each other. That's what the threat prioritization aspect of the AVCDL is intended to accomplish. In the development of any complex system, there's a strong motivation to have processes and procedures which can be shared and require few changes to existing workflows. The threat prioritization process was designed with these goals in mind. One way the workflow achieves its light touch is by having a single, simple mechanism for feeding changes back into earlier processes. To illustrate, we'll use this diagram. It's a bit of an eye chart, so we'll look at it in stages. But basically, what we're showing here is that the activities providing feedback follow a common path. Although they don't generate feedback, the foundation and requirement phases receive feedback from other phases, specifically in the area of requirements. In the design phase, what we see is that both the attack surface analysis and threat modeling activities can filter into the threat prioritization process. We'll cover this in detail shortly. As we can see, the threat prioritization process sends feedback through the issue tracking system into either the element design review or the element requirements review. In the implementation phase, we can see four activities which are feeding into the threat prioritization process. Those being fuzz testing, static analysis, dynamic analysis, and security code review. The feedback can go either directly into the element implementation process of the implementation phase, or depending on the scope of the change required, into the element design review of the design phase, or the element requirements review of the requirements phase. Similarly, in the verification phase, we see that the penetration testing, attack surface analysis review, and threat modeling review activities feed into the same threat prioritization process, feeding back into the stages that we've mentioned already. And finally, in the operation phase, cybersecurity monitoring also feeds into the threat prioritization process. The advantage that we have is that regardless of the activity that we undertake within the AVCDL, 
we have a single, simple, consistent set of activities that we do regardless of the threat's source. Now let's look at all of these areas at the same time. For this, we're going to refer to the AVCDL framework diagram. We can see that secure design review, attack surface analysis, and threat modeling in the design phase, static analysis, dynamic analysis, fuzz testing, and secure code review in the implementation phase, penetration testing, threat model review, and attack surface analysis review in the verification phase, and identification and confirmation of vulnerabilities in the operations phase all serve as threat sources feeding into a common threat prioritization process. Here's our overall workflow. The methodology used is based on guidance from NIST SP800-30. Within the workflow, we have three individual activities, threat candidate ranking, ranked threat candidate risking, and threat candidate slicing. Let's examine each of these activities in detail. The first activity in the threat prioritization workflow is threat candidate ranking. In this activity, we're ranking in order to establish the relative exploitability or likelihood of each threat candidate. As mentioned earlier, these candidates can be sourced from several activities, including threat modeling, incident response, and attack surface analysis. The ranking itself should be done using a standard methodology, such as the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS. There are additional methodologies, and we'll be discussing those later when we cover quantization. The ranking system used should consider such factors as mechanism, locality, maturity, scope, and required privileges. Ranking lends itself to a continuous system, and once ranked, a threshold may be applied in order to reduce the number of candidates to be considered in the risking activity. If the threshold is applied, the dismissed candidates must be documented along with the dismissal rationale in the candidate source tracker. This is seen here in the notification that goes back from the ranking activity. Generally speaking, the minimum inputs for this process are going to be the what, the where, and the worst case of each threat candidate. And the output will include the likelihood of that threat candidate. Generally, the AVCDL recommends that information exchange between various parts of the cybersecurity activity pipeline be done using a JSON encoded serif file. Serif, the static analysis report interchange format, is highly flexible and is supported by numerous applications. Here's a table showing a number of processes which generate threat candidates and how they can be represented in serif. The processes in this table are listed in the order that they appear within the AVCDL. If we start with static analysis, we can see that it has a test which is a checker, it has a location being a file and a line, and it has an issue which is a rule violation. Notice that static analysis, fuzz testing, and source code review are very similar in that they all are using checkers and have location information defined by file and line combination. In the case of secure code review, the checker is a manual list of things that are being reviewed by the person doing the secure code review. In the case of fuzz testing, the issue is a specific fault because generally speaking, fuzz testing operates by running tests and reporting failures. If we look at threat modeling, we see that rather than a checker, we have a rule. And rather than a location, we have a graphic, because threat modeling is traditionally done using data flow diagrams. The issue we get is a violation of that rule. Similarly, with dynamic analysis, we have a checker, with the issue being a failure of that checker, similar to the way that fuzz testing works. 
In this case, the location is a variable resolution location. This is to say that depending on the amount of information we have, we're going to be able to identify the location of the fault with various degrees of precision. For penetration testing and incident response, well, we have our tests with location being test steps. Both have issues which represent failures that have been identified. These are very high level, very process oriented in nature. The last thing for consideration is attack surface analysis. This one's a bit more abstract in that we're looking at types of attack surfaces. Instead of location, we're considering the exposure that is expressed by that surface. And our issue is an excess of access via the exposed surface. Now, these are not one to one to each other. However, from a conceptual standpoint, SARIF allows us to convey information in a way which allows us to have a uniform mechanism for processing the data. The second activity in the threat prioritization workflow is threat candidate risking. Here, a risk SME takes the ranked threat candidates and assigns a risk impact to each. As a reminder, our ranked threat candidates contain the information of what the threat is, where it's located, what the worst case scenario is, and what the likelihood as determined by the ranking activity was. And the output augments the input information with the impact information. The third activity in the threat prioritization workflow is threat candidate slicing. We take the threat candidates, which have been both ranked and risked, and slice them. That is, we bisect the space they exist in to determine which present an uncontrolled risk. These are designated as uncontrolled threats and forwarded to the issue tracking system. If an issue is determined to be controlled, an update dismissed candidate notification is sent to the source tracker document in order to record this. Additionally, a threat report will be generated for audit purposes. It's important to note that it's the responsibility of the standard issue management process to disposition issues by applying the standard risk treatments of avoid, reduce, share, or retain. Additionally, it's necessary to document the reason for this disposition. And as a reminder, our inputs are what the threat is, where it's located, what the worst case is, what the likelihood is, and what its impact is. The output list is truncated in that we're only including the uncontrolled threats. And so, rather than indicating whether a threat is controlled or uncontrolled, we simply provide a priority for the threat. The reason for this is that all the threats being entered into the issue tracking system are uncontrolled threats. Now let's take a moment and look at how we're going to actually do the slicing operation itself. Here's a diagram that shows the way that slicing or determination of controlled and uncontrolled threats is achieved. The diagram is adapted from the FDA's Post-Market Management of Cybersecurity and Medical Devices document. We have the values from the ranking and the risking activities, the likelihood and impact values. We're showing them here as being continuous. Similarly, the range from controlled to uncontrolled is also being shown as continuous. The line bisecting the exploitability severity space shown here in red, is the risk appetite. We need it not only to establish those threats we consider controlled or uncontrolled, but also to prioritize them. Above the line, the threats are deemed to be uncontrolled, that is, in need of mitigation. We'll cover the mechanism used to make the determination of controlled versus uncontrolled and risk appetite in a bit. One of the questions that comes up a lot is given a set of uncontrolled threats, which ones are the most important to deal with? If we just do a strict bisection, 
and say that everything above the line is uncontrolled, that doesn't really help us much. One way to address this issue is to take the set of points in the space and consider the magnitude of the normals from the risk appetite line to the individual plotted threats. We can then assign an ordering based on the magnitude of the normal. Now, this is a wonderful theoretical approach, and although it's possible to apply the math behind it, this is not typically how organizations address this particular problem. So let's look at how it is typically handled. The typical way that organizations deal with the likelihood and impact information is through quantization. Quantization is built into most of the tools used to determine the impact and the likelihood. And also, because of this, they're baked into the various standards. One reason for the adoption of quantized rather than continuous values is that people believe it to reduce the decision-making complexity. So let's look at how likelihood and impact are quantized. Probably the most well-known likelihood ranking system is CVSS. CVSS is a system which has a score ranging from 0.0 to 10.0 in increments of 0.1. It's a system based on the ordering of 100 unique threats in a particular order, but which can be quantized into 12 buckets, as shown here. CVSS also specifies a rating which quantizes only to five levels of interest technically four, but a true zero or none is added so that we can actually talk about a zero value. The buckets for the rating system are none, low, medium, high, and critical. These values can be mapped directly to the requirement of ISO SA 21434, which has very low, low, medium, and high. CVSS works reasonably well for many things, but not all. Two other systems worth mentioning stem from work done by NIST. These are the Common Configuration Scoring System and the Common Misuse Scoring System. They're intended to complement CVSS. Where CVSS focuses on the vulnerabilities of a system, CCSS focuses on its configuration. The problem lies not with the design of the system, but rather the metadata tailoring its behavior. In the case of CMSS, the focus is on system misuse. Both the design and the configuration may be correct, but the system is being leveraged for an unintended use case. Both these scoring systems calculate their rankings using mechanisms similar to those used in CVSS. Additionally, these ranking systems have the same range of values. For quantization in the impact space, let's take a look at the safety domain. There's ISO 26262, which is the safety standard for automotive. We also have ISO 14971 the safety standard for medical devices. ISO SAE 21434, which specifies a numeric quantization standard for use with automotive cybersecurity. And finally, FIPS 199, which is the IT standard addressing risk. You'll note that these don't line up perfectly. As you can see that 26262 has a three value ranking system as with likelihood quantization, zero or no impact value has been added in order to have a true zero. In order to go from ISO 26262 space to ISO SAE 21434 space, you actually require more resolution than 26262's numeric values provide. What we have in the impact space is far less granularity when compared with what we have in the likelihood space. This is vastly different from the continuous space presented earlier. 
Now let's see what happens when we combine our slicing diagram from earlier with the concept of quantization. Let's start with our most granular level, that being the CVSS 12 bucket score and the 6 bucket ISO SAE 21434. Now let's compare that with the CVSS 5 bucket rank and the ISO SAE 21434 mapping. There are far fewer buckets to consider. Let's look at how this compares using the CVSS rank against ISO 26262. And finally, here's CVSS versus FIPS 199. You can get a sense of the impact of quantization, but it's still a bit abstract at this point. So let's look at what happens if we shade the boxes using our risk appetite line as the basis for slicing. We'll apply a simple 51% rule as to whether or not we include a particular bucket and use the risk appetite line to decide where to slice. We now can see more clearly how that affects the buckets that we consider uncontrolled. As you can see here, the high granularity case is going to give us the greatest number of discrete items. As we go through the previously mentioned combinations, you'll see that each of the choices made for the decomposition of the space has an impact on what values you're going to pick up for a given choice of risk appetite. This brings us back to the problem of prioritization. Let's look once again at the continuous representation. As covered earlier, we take the magnitude of the normals and use them to determine what the prioritization is going to be. Now this methodology can be used, but it's not really workable for the quantized form because we would have to end up using the center point of each bucket for any value that it contained. So that's not really a workable strategy. Let's look at a way to look at the buckets and still come up with a prioritization. Here what we've done is taken the numeric values for the 12 bucket CVSS and the 6 bucket ISO SE 21434 and multiplied them together. We can see here that these are the floor values for the CVSS buckets, which is why the value of 0.1 is here since it's the lowest non-zero CVSS value. And then for the 21434 values we go from 0 to 5. Now we could do all sorts of mathematical gymnastics to ensure that each value is unique. For instance you could put weightings on them to make them um, the ones that are exactly the same be different values based on their weighting from the impact space versus the likelihood space. But in terms of rough values, just multiplying these base values together is reasonable. These can stand in as a good proxy for doing all the hard math of figuring the normals to the space and the centers of the buckets. Typically, when we think about risk in safety critical systems, we're thinking about safety risk. But in reality, there are multiple domains of risk. So let's look at four of those domains, which are specified in Avita D2.3, security requirements for automotive onboard network based on dark side scenarios, and talk about each domain and how we'll address them collectively in the context of threat prioritization. The first domain is safety. We're concerned here with the functional safety of the vehicle occupants and the road users. Our second domain is finance. How do we prevent fraudulent transactions 
from taking place via the electronic systems within the vehicle and its connected infrastructure? And how do we prevent the vehicle itself from being stolen? The third domain is privacy. The focus here is on the privacy of both the vehicle users and the IP of the OEM and suppliers. This gets down to things like the code that's running in the vehicle or the data stores that are being held in the vehicle. And our fourth area is that of operation. The concern is the operational performance of the vehicle and things which can perturb that operational performance. Together, all these domains of risk have to be considered for any threat candidate. Now, that's wonderful. Now we have four domains of risk instead of just one. How do we deal with that? In order to accomplish this multi-domain workflow, let's go back to our original workflow diagram, which you can see here, where we have the ranking, the risking, and the slicing. Now let's take it and break it up so that we can address those multiple domains. Here we see the risking and slicing activities are replicated. Specifically, there's going to be one set of these per risk domain. Additionally, we have a new activity that needs to take place. That's the consolidation of the risk domain results. This comes between the uncontrolled threats and the issue tracking system. Let's look at that particular step. Here we have the consolidation activity. We take the uncontrolled threats from each of the risk domains that have been risked and then sliced using their respective criteria for slicing. And because the appetite for each of these risk domains is going to differ, we'll consolidate them in such a way as to deduplicate any items which come from multiple risk domains. Now, when we deduplicate, we do so maintaining the traceability back to all the contributors for the consolidated threats as we enter them into the issue tracking system. And finally, we generate a consolidated threat report for audit purposes. So, to summarize, the threat prioritization approach used within the AVCDL allows us to have uniform treatment of all threat sources. It specifies a common data interchange format, that being serif. The approach works either for continuous or quantized metrics. And finally, the approach works with both single and multiple risk domains. Hopefully it's appreciated that this methodology is far closer to our desired orchestration than it is to that herd of one-man bands. And implementation of it gives you a lot more leverage dealing with cybersecurity throughout the product development cycle. All AVCDL materials, both in source and distribution forms, are available on our GitHub site, as shown here. Because of the size of the repository, it's recommended that you either clone the repository or download a zip archive of it, if you're not familiar with using Git. Instructions for downloading a zip archive are linked to on the repository's front page. With this training complete, you can proceed to one of the more specific areas. These are attack surface analysis, threat modeling, penetration testing, vulnerability identification, static analysis, dynamic analysis, fuzz testing, and secure code review. Some of these may have other prerequisites, and so be sure to check as to whether all of the prerequisites have been attended to before taking a given course. Here are the references to the source material used in the creation of this presentation. 
They'll also be included in the video description. Additionally, this presentation source material will be provided on the AVCDL GitHub repository.